Hello and welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Cooney. I'm the director of the Veralist Center for Art and Politics and delighted to welcome you to this very first panel in the new year for us. Um, it feels like we haven't been in this room for a long time and I'm delighted to be here for this um, particular talk and want to thank you all very, very much for coming. The um, conversation is, or the presentation is conducted by B. Wirtz, who is one of the seminal artists in sculpture and sculptural thinking, I think, in this country. Um, I went through my tiny little library at home and uh, looked for sources of um, his thinking that have influenced my own. And among many others, I came across this booklet, which was published in 2010 by the University of Illinois at Chicago. It's a little exhibition catalog with the name or with the title 70 plus 30 equals 2000. And I just want to read one quote here, um, which is a Swiss proverb. I have never heard it, but it reads very well. It says, a good spectator also creates. And with that, I want to thank you for braving the winter storm and for being here. And I also want to thank Sculpture Center for, I think it's been now six years of collaborations on this series of talks. Is that right, Ruba? Nine. Nine even. Wow. Well, well, it's been a really important program for us. And Ruba Katrib, the curator of Sculpture Center, will now introduce B Words. And um, thank you. Enjoy this conversation. Thank you, Karen. Um, and thanks, everyone, again, for uh, braving the snow and coming out today. And welcome to Subjective Histories of Sculpture, which has been an ongoing collaboration between Sculpture Center and the Verilis Center for Art and Politics at the New School. Um, and so, as Karen mentioned, this is our ninth year collaborating on the program, which features select artists speaking on the things, the people, the artworks, movies, ideas, you know, everything that has influenced and impacted their work. The program aims to explore how art contemporary artists think about sculpture, its history, its legacies, and potential for Im innovation. Um, past speakers have included Martin Curcells, Simon Starling, Dominique Gonzalez Forrester, and Tricia Donnelly. This year, we are very pleased to kick off the program with New York-based B. Wirtz, who will be speaking tonight. And um, on April 7th, we'll have Thai artist Arya Lasmelendensuk. <laughs> She'll be speaking as well. I think there's more information at the front. And also at the front, we have information about um, a performance program we're having at Sculpture Center this Saturday, if you guys are interested in more info. Um, so tonight, um, we are thrilled to have B. Wirtz. And B has developed a very precise economy and language of materials and forms over the past few decades he has been active as an artist. Um, his sculptural works are often staggering, staggering in their simplicity. Um, and he's a, an especially significant artist for this program in great part because of the influence he, and impact he has had on so many artists working today. Um, so his talk will trace not only his own history as an artist, but also speak to um, the continuing concerns of sculptural practice now. Um, B was born in 1948 in Pasadena, California, and he received a BA from the University of California at Berkeley in 1970 and an MFA from California Institute of the Arts in 1980. And his work has been exhibited in venues such as MoMA PS1, Abrams Art Center, MCA Chicago, um, Musée d'Art Contemporain de Lyon in France, um, RISD Museum of Art, and the museums of Bat Yam, Israel. So I'm very much looking forward to this talk, and I would like to thank B again for participating. And I hope you guys enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ruba and Karen. Very nice introduction. Oh, I'm going to raise this up a little. Um, OK, I'm. I'm going to show images thanks to Google Images for helping me get these images. And they're related, there are things from my past um, really up to the present moment that, that I feel have 
shaped what my artwork is. Um, Ruba, I think my notes disappeared with yours. Um, okay, so um, first image building blocks was, uh, I'd say, my absolute favorite toy as a child. Um, I had like store-bought blocks that were given to me and I also had, my, and my dad, who was an engineer, also had a, like a garage workshop where he made basically what they called hobby in those days. I don't know if they still use that word, but um, he liked to make furniture, objects. He made like doll furniture for my sister, you know, things for the house. And so he also would like cut up pieces of wood for me, so, so like homemade blocks. So I had this sort of large accumulation of, of you know, store-bought kind of blocks and then the, the piece of wood that my father uh, cut up and gave to me. And um, I used to sit on the garage floor when I was very small while he was working on his projects and he would give me little pieces of wood which I would glue together into little houses and I would draw doors and windows on them with crayons. And I, and I really think those were my first sculptures. Um, the other thing that happened when I was very young was when we, when we, whenever we went on uh, car trips, vacations, my parents would buy us little notebooks, and so it's constantly drawing as well. Um, the drawing, I think, still comes up in a lot of my sculpture. Uh, I, I really like like wire, shoelaces, linear things that I kind of feel like continue that in, that interest in in drawing. Here's another type of locks. I definitely had some of this type. Uh, later, plastic bricks that sn uh, snap together. Um, comp I would make in really large installations in my bedroom with building kind of cities, which incorporated my train set that would sometimes stay up for like days or maybe a weeks. I don't remember how long. But, uh, and then, uh, then I'd make another one later. Um, my, okay, I, I lived briefly in Northern California, uh, Palo Alto Menlo Park, and we moved to Santa Barbara in the middle of my kindergarten year. My mother took me to the kindergarten class, uh, which was, you know, already going. It was the middle of the year, and she told the teacher that I was really shy and I was going to have trouble interacting with the other students, which was actually basically true for the year. However, the day she took me, they were playing with big blocks in the classroom, and so I immediately, I just couldn't res resist the blocks. I went and joined right in, and my mother said she felt like a complete fool, like the teacher looked at her like she was crazy. But it was only the blocks that I just couldn't resist. Um, okay, uh, next. Here's a work of mine from um, 1993, which I think still shows that impulse of building with blocks, um, which I, you know, recent works I just made, I think, still relate to that impulse. Um, I had, like, definitely some of those type of pillar blocks, and I had a little um, setup that sort of looked like the facade of a Greek temple, and for some, I don't know, somehow I had read something about the Parthenon. Here's a replica of the Parthenon in Nashville. Um, 
And so I would set up this little, this little facade of the Parthenon, and I would give myself this little lecture uh, <laughs> about what I knew about the Parthenon. I, I do remember a couple of things, like the, the lintel, the piece across the top of the pillars is actually slightly curved up to, um, because otherwise if it's exactly straight, your eye tends to see it as sagging a bit. And, and it's also interesting that the columns uh, bulge slightly as if to show they're supporting the weight. There, there was a lot of other stuff. I kind of remember giving this funny little lecture to myself going on and on. But um, here's another one of my works from 1984. Um, definitely Greek temple-like. It's made with a red, frid, red frisbee. This was actually a, an early piece in a pretty big series of works I did that I, I call the photo object works where I would make this little sculpture that would sit directly on the floor and then I photographed it looking up as if it were very monumental. Okay, another total favorite toy from childhood was the Ames House of Cards. This is the small card set, which you can actually still get at MoMA. They can, it's still in production. I don't know if it stopped for a while, but it's definitely in production now. It might have actually stopped for a while now that I think about it, but um, um, anyway, absolutely loved these because it wasn't only that you could make these three-dimensional things with it, but the cards had these absolutely wonderful images on them. Um, they, I also had the giant house of cards, which they is not in production anymore. Um, I would set, I would make towers out on our lawn and dump our cat through the tower. And, and years later, I worried that I was kind of torturing the cat by doing this, and my mother pointed out that the cat didn't have to hang around. Um, so he was kind of into it. But unfortunately, I destroyed the cards. I'm sure they'd be collector's items if I still had them. Um, in the mid-'80s, uh, mid-century modernism kind of really came back into vogue again. And some books came out on the Ames, a big one with a gray cover that I have. And in this book, there was a page showing all the giant house of cards with all the images. And I hadn't seen them in so many years. And this memories just came fl flooding back from all these images on the cards. Okay, this, um, I never had this many cards, but I certainly would have wished I could have made something that big. The thing that was great, a very um, Amesian, is that the backs of the cards had this wonderful design, this kind of simpler design, but I really uh, also loved that design. It's like very memorable. Um, my parents did not actually have Ames furniture, but I knew people, you know, I saw it in other houses, also very memorable. Uh, our next door neighbor in Santa Barbara did have this, the leather lounge chair in Ottoman, which I distinctly remember. Uh, then what happened was, when Anne and I, my wife Anne and I moved to New York in 1985, it was still possible to get this kind of original furniture for pretty cheap in you know, like thrift stores. There was a great little store called Las Venus on the Lower East Side. I used to get stuff really inexpensively. So um, basically our apartment was kind of furnished with this kind of look. Um, a lot of Ames furniture. Uh, I, 
you know, growing up in California, I, di I didn't personally know Charles and Ray Ames, but because they were, what they did was so part of my life, it was, uh, it was almost like they uh, were, felt like family members. Okay, another interest when I was very young was Gothic cathedrals, which I think are kind of funny in the context of the blocks because we're so used to large buildings now which have like inner structures made out of steel uh, frameworks and that this really is just a big pile of blocks. And I did a fourth grade project where I made a wooden model of this Notre Dame de Paris and I did a, a, drew an elaborate floor plan of it, and I knew the whole thing about the flying buttresses holding up the walls. If they weren't there, the whole thing would just burst apart. Um, now, in Santa Barbara, we had sort of our version of that. This is the Santa Barbara Mission, which is made of adobe blocks stacked up. Um, so I saw that from very small child and really loved that building. I actually, in the fourth grade, made a little model of the Santa Barbara Mission. And I recently, fairly recently, did a project with Triple Canopy, an online project in which this image appears, um, so I still have that object. The, the project involves other things from my early childhood, um, and you can, if you go to the Triple Canopy website, you can see the whole project if you are interested. Okay, this is the Santa Barbara Courthouse. Um, modeled on, I believe, Spanish palaces, uh, maybe a con like a mixture of them. Um, this is an interesting style. This is the Spanish colonial revival style of architecture, which basically was from the year 1915 to 1930, generally. Um, um, a lot in California and a huge amount in Santa Barbara. There was a massive earthquake in 1925 in Santa Barbara and the town was rebuilt basically in this style. Um, and of course, there's definitely Spanish-Mexican heritage in California, but this image of Santa Barbara was a, like a real fantasy. Um, and you know, it was interesting because we, my parents took us to Disneyland shortly after it opened. I absolutely love Disneyland. And, but I was already living in this sort of funny kind of a Disneyland place anyway, this sort of fantasy world of Santa Barbara. Um, talk a little more, more about the architecture there in a minute, but uh, here we have the Santa Barbara Art Museum, which was, had originally been the post office. Uh, it was a very nice museum for a small town, a pretty good collection, and a really big part of my life. Uh, not only what they had there, but they had art classes on the weekends down, down this basement room, and I really love those classes. They basically just gave you paper and paint or whatever, and you could make art down there. And I went there one day, and there were magic markers, which I really think they had just been invented. I'd never seen magic markers before. And I made this drawing with like a kind of an amusement park with a Ferris wheel with all these balloons with magic marker. I was pretty proud of it and the teacher really liked it. So that, that also made me happy. Um, here's the entrance courtyard is when you walk into the museum. Um, 
they had a, as you can see, pretty good, uh, pretty good um, collection of some Greek sculpture. That fountain made a little uh, splashing sound, which I distinctly remember. There was a um, that balcony upstairs. Um, there was a collection of toys, mainly Victorian toys, up there that my sister and I really loved. I really loved to look at that. Uh, I do have this memory that there was an exhibition there, and it was when P Picasso was still alive. There was a l very small Picasso drawing in this exhibition, and I don't know like why a museum would be selling art, but I remember this being for sale, and it was like a few hundred dollars, which was definitely more money than I could spend, but I do remember thinking, didn't seem like that much money. Um, too bad I didn't like somehow figure out how to get the money, because I don't think it would cost that now. I also remember s for some reason seeing a auction catalog when I was at the museum, and there was there were images of Marcel Duchamp pieces, and they were really inexpensive compared to the other work in the catalog, which seemed really odd to me. And I don't think that would be the case now anymore either. Okay, this is the Fox Arlington Theater, which I really loved. It used to have the letters Fox going down on top of the spire. I, I think, I don't know if they show films there anymore, but uh, I, they do definitely have live performances there. When I grew up, it was strictly a Hollywood-type movie theater. Uh, here, this is the entrance from State Street going back into the theater. And this is the interior of the theater, which was absolutely amazing. It had this night sky with little electric lights that were the stars and this little village on either side. Uh, I went there probably junior high school age with my friend David, and we saw the James Bond film Dr. No, which was the first one. I, I think David's father probably read the Bond books, and that's how he knew about it. I, I knew nothing about this film. I still remember it starting out, and then at some point, there's Dr. No's lair underground with all the machines and everything, and I was just blown away with what had this film had turned into. Um, so that's a pretty distinct memory from that theater. Okay, this is um, a pretty typical house in Santa Barbara in the Spanish colonial revival style. Um, and this was the kind of architecture I saw a lot. However, there was also, it was not this house because it no longer exists, but a little ways further up State Street from the the Fox Arlington Theater, there was this gigantic Victorian house that just did not fit with anything else around. I have a distinct memory of it. I called it the big old house. It was very dark, very tall, and I think that is where my fascination began with Victorian architecture. It was just so clearly from some other age, just completely detached from where we were at that point. Uh, my, and then the, th the amazing thing about, the great thing about Victorian houses is when they get a little decayed, they, have, they get this Charles Adams aspect to them. My father all had always had a subscription to the New Yorker, so I was very aware of Charles Adams, and uh, I'm sure that was also part of the appeal of the Victorian houses for me. So what's really interesting about Victorian houses, houses is I, I would not defend them as great architecture. They're a little silly. They're 
maybe a little weird, but there's something I absolutely love about their, I guess what I'd call their personalities. They're not afraid to stand there tall and have this very strange, loud personality. It's one of the things I really admire about them. Um, I went to, fairly recently, a little talk that was um, sponsored by the Greenwich Village Society for Historical Preservation. It was about wooden houses in New York. And there are very few left, for obvious reasons. Uh, I think they actually, at one point, didn't even allow them anymore because of fire problem. But there were two... Um, speakers that evening, a woman who was very into Victorian architecture and the man who was more in, he had amazing information about like early construction methods of wooden, wooden houses, you know, going back to Europe, early civilization. And his attitude was that Domestic architecture basically stopped with the Victorian era. He, he just thought it was really crass. I don't know what he would think of. He might be okay with contemporary architecture, but he just thought the fact that they would, you know, basically churn out these gingerbread parts with jigsaws, um, just what he just didn't consider that architecture. But uh, but the woman was really into it, and so. Like I said, what I find interesting is not, you know, whether they're great architecture or not, but just th that they have, I think, these enormous personalities. And then, of course, that the added benefit when they get a little decrepit, that Charles Adams aspect starts to come in. Okay, this I found online. This was uh, somebody constructed this model. This was what I aspired to as a child. I actually tried to make something like this once out of parts of my block set, and I got kind of so far and then I had no idea how to go any further. And I actually saved the thing and made it into another sculpture in the 70s. So it turned into something at least. Um, this is a work of mine from 1989, which I think pretty architectural and perhaps even related to the, the Victorian house thing. Okay, the next I'm going to something else of qu perhaps questionable taste or design quality, but also I think with big personalities would be 1950s automobiles, which I was just completely into. Maybe partly from living in California, but I could identify all makes of cars and years. These, I know these two Chevrolets are from 1957. The upper right Etzel, I'm guessing 1958. But at the time, I would have known exactly. The thing that's, to me, also great about these exuberant designs is that they also have these incredible colors. and. And then some, and a lot of times it wasn't just one color, it was two colors or three colors. Okay, the one on the left column in the center, my friend David's parents actually had one of those cars, it was called a Ford Skyliner. It was really amazing because it basically had a hard top 
that you would push a button, the back trunk opened, and the thing would fold into the trunk, and then the trunk would come down, and then you had a convertible. Okay, this is a Buick from a little earlier, earlier in the 50s, but I have a really distinct memory of being very small and seeing these Buicks with this grill, which I called teeth. So I called them Buicks with teeth, and I had this whole little image of the hood opening, and it was a mouth, uh, and that they would bite. So I was always looking for the Buicks with teeth. And then here's when the teeth disappeared, but I was older, so I was, I think, a bit beyond that other little fantasy, but I definitely would have liked this car. Okay, next I'm going to go to something else, which I think I would not call these questionable tastes, but I absolutely but i do think these also have big personalities calder mobiles which i always remember i never remember not seeing knowing about a calder mobile so i went to uc Santa Barbara for two years, and there were many um, requirements then, probably more so now, like outside your regular field for to, um, that you had to study to get your degree. So when I was in, at UC Santa Barbara, uh, I basically fulfilled my requirements so that when I transferred to UC Berkeley, um, after two years, I could really just take art classes at Berkeley. And one of my first art classes, the teacher had us make something and bring it in to show the class, and we were going to discuss what we had made. And I made, basically, and this is really embarrassing to tell this, but I, it kind of fascinates me. I basically made a Calder Mobile out of wire, I the the shapes, I didn't have metal, but I had pieces of plastic that I cut into shapes, I attached the wire to it, I brought in this mobile. And the teacher said, well, it was too derivative of Alexander Calder. And I was not ignorant at that point about art history, but I did, I hadn't even thought that it was one artist that had invented this. It just seemed almost like this natural life form that had come into the world on its own that had no, you know, didn't need a human connection. So obviously I was starting to learn. It's good I was in school. Um, so I, I went back and I made this object, th another hanging object, which is kind of this cube thing, also made out of plastic with wires sticking out with all kinds of things inside it and sticking out, and much more successful. And also the teacher really liked it. He, he, I think he was kind of amazed that I'd gotten over my being stuck so quickly. But... I would absolutely list Calder as a being hugely important. The mobiles, I mean, don't think so much about the drawings. Not that I would necessarily dislike them, but the mobiles are just hugely important to me. Just never get tired of looking at them. Okay, here's one of my works from 
1999 called Collection, which I think is pretty calderish in its way. It's made of wood wire buttons are sitting on the base. Um, and the things that are hanging are unmounted 35 millimeter slides of uh, runway fashion models, hence the connection with the buttons. And here's a piece from 1997, probably my most clearly indebted to Calder work I ever made, which is untitled, but the ni I've always called it the Calder piece, its nickname. Okay, we're back in Santa Barbara. This is the Santa Barbara Public Library, where I went with my friend Gary after high school. We'd walk there after high school, ostensibly to do our homework. And to the right part of the image, there was a large room that had tables in the middle and art around the side presented by the Santa Barbara Art Association probably mostly not making its way into art, future art history, but there was something pretty great about being a town in a town where there was art around and there was that pretty great art museum. My friend Gary and I would uh, look at all the work, evaluate what we liked or what we didn't. We seemed like we spent a lot of time like joking and laughing instead of doing our homework. Um, but one thing, and this has been hu was hugely important to me. The, the library had this magazine, Studio International, which I would look at all the time when I went there. And this is, and this is interestingly why I had no excuse for not getting the Calder thing, except at this point, Calder really wouldn't be in this magazine because this magazine was all about the most recent types of things happening in art. Um, so this is what really started to change my outlook about art, getting more interested in things like Duchamp. Um, and then, you know, Duchamp was, I'm gonna talk a little bit about taste later, but Duchamp, um, I'd remembered reading very early on that he claimed he used no personal taste in choosing the um, ready-mades, which I don't believe that, but I do completely understand why he said that at the time, part of his project. Um, so I guess, I guess I realized later when I was also an artist using found objects that I was never gonna pretend I didn't use taste, but was also, completely different time and I didn't need to do that the way Duchamp did. But, you know, I was, I think through this magazine and, you know, getting more interested in pop art, conceptual art. I really like Andy Warhol a lot. I'm sure that started to happen during this period. Uh, Fluxus kind of work. I'm sure that was, th those were kind of things I would see in that magazine. I do also remember seeing the, er, the um, Philip Guston paintings made with uh, the cartoonish um, imagery that he started making after he kind of abandoned the the other abstraction, which I really love, but I also didn't know enough about his history to be one of those people that was all upset, which I found out later. Many people are upset that he started doing that kind of work. He was like betraying the abstract tradition, but I really have an image of seeing that work in that magazine at the library, though, and really being into it. Here's some more Fluxus kind of work. This is Eva Hess, who I only saw her work in person probably when we moved to New York in 1985, but I certainly knew her work from, I'm sure, from that magazine, and I would count her as being 
perhaps influential on my work as well. So here's a piece um, I made, 1973, that I think really connects to that kind of conceptual work I was seeing in that magazine and thinking about. And I, when I made this work, it seemed like something di definitely different to me, um, that I'd kind of made a little jump somewhere else. Um, Okay, what's funny is that I realized I did have this sort of funny connection with conceptual art before it even existed. Uh, when we lived in either Menlo Park or P Palo Alto, I went to a nursery school, I guess what they'd call daycare now. Uh, I have distinct memories of this place. It was this woman's house, a very large house, and you went, entered through a, on a driveway that went over a bridge, probably like a little creek ran in front, and there was like a big circular driveway. There was a fountain on the side. We used to play in the fountain. And one day we had like art class or whatever she was thinking of it, crafts, whatever. Um, so we had pieces of paper and all kinds of magazine images, various images that we could cut out and collage to make things. So I decided that I, I remember, I can kind of see the piece of paper. I decided to glue down, I think it was maybe an image of a dog. I glued the dog down on the page. And then I cut out a house, an image of a house. And I was going to glue the house on top of the dog because the dog was in the house. For some reason, the woman who ran the nursery school was standing there and told me I couldn't do it because I was wasting paper. And I didn't, like, I wasn't, like, horribly hurt or I think I just sort of accepted okay I can't do that but what's weird is I never ever forgot that and I think that you know in thinking about the um, Studio International I kind of feel like that magazine was giving me permission to do whatever I wanted even though at that young age she's kind of telling me not to but obviously I took it in and it didn't like, you know, dampen my spirit in the long run. Um, okay, my friend Gary, the one I studied that I supposedly s did homework with. Um, later, when we were in our 20s, I actually didn't see him so much. He, li he lived in another city, but he uh, took uh, classes in Japanese Ikebana, uh, which I knew very little about. I, I guess I started from what he told me, realizing this was not just sticking flowers in a vase. It was an art form, you know, with a lot of philosophical content to it. And I, and I remember him telling me things like that they thought about the sun as a light source, and then that when you arrange these elements, often it would be like facing the light source, things like that. So I myself never did Ikebana, but he got me interested in it, and I think what I did was I started to apply some of the things I felt I learned about it to my own work. I do think a lot of my sculptures, even though they're like manufactured objects, I think some of them do sort of have a reference to natural plant forms. And there was actually an exhibition so a few years ago in Los Angeles curated by the wonderful Karen Higa, who sadly just died recently. She curated an exhibition that had to do with contemporary art and 
uh, Ikebana, and the exhibition had groups in LA that practiced different ty schools of Ikebana. This is one of the pieces that was in the show. So they would arrange their work in the show, and then there were m quite a few contemporary artists. I was one of them. And it was a really fascinating combination. And I thought a great way to kind of present this Ikebana as being so much more related to sculpture than maybe it's normally thought about. So here's a few mo of my works from the early 90s, which I think were kind of directly related to my interest in that. And this piece is from 1994 called Bunch. Okay, another thing which I had actually always liked before I knew anything about Ikebana was Japanese bonsai, which I think are very interesting objects because they're clearly tree-like, but they're not like literally imitating a tree. But they're tree-like enough that when we look at it in our mind, we think of a tree. Um, Because they really are just a small plant and a pot cut in a certain way. They are not a tree, yet that sort of happens in our mind. So and uh, I was invited to curate a show at White Columns, and this was in 2008, and I decided to do a three-dimensional sculpture show that was related to the idea of bonsai and also the children's blocks idea. So it was about, you know, fairly small kinds of works that were both by artists and some designers, um, things that I had in my own collection, that I felt when one looked at them could imagine a much larger, them being a much larger kind of world or ob larger object in the world. They are, uh, they are what they are, but they do something interesting, I, I think, in one's mind, th depending on how you look at them. And the piece in the foreground, a uh, little Saul of Wit, um, which of course is just a minimalist Saul of Wit, which is wonderful. But to me, it also kind of references a house, a model of a house, or I just feel like you could see other things in it. Um, okay, what, what I'm going, where I'm going next is, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, getting, kind of getting near the end, but I wanted to talk a little bit about taste. I mentioned it in relation to Duchamp. I mentioned it, and I think the the Victorian houses and the 1550s automobiles are interesting in relation to taste because, like I said, I would not defend those things as great design, but I cannot ignore what they do have. Uh, now, I'm going to actually read a little something that Lynn Tillman wrote uh, in Freeze magazine. She's kind of talking about the Calvin Tompkins book that came out recently on Duchamp. Um, let me preface it, though, with what this, this image is from the work of d designer uh, Dagobert Pekka, who was connected with the Vienna Werkstatt, uh, which you may know about. Joseph Hoffman was a key figure in the Vienna Werkstatt, and Dagobert Pekka met him. And then a bit later in the run of that organization became very influential in the kind of things that were 
produced there a little more um, baroque or odd than the Joseph Hoffman aesthetic. Uh, there was a an exhibition in I think 2000, 2002, yes, 2002 at the Neue Gallery here in New York. I saw that exhibition and you saw earlier like the Ames furniture. I was very into mid-century modern. That's what our apartment looked like. I remember walking into the show thinking, this is not my thing. But I could feel myself kind of wanting to let go of that and just go into it with like an open mind. And I ended up really l actually loving the show. Um, and so I, what I did was I tried to kind of apply that to the future. I think it's always good to question one's habits of taste. Um, it just opened up some th something new that I just didn't know about. I, I thought it was kind of wonderful. Um, so I'm going to, this isn't so long, but I'm going to read Lynn Tillman's uh, part of what she wrote relating to the Duchamp book. Um, how taste and preferences changed. Change. In work and love, people get boxed in, edged out, ruined. Others find acceptance. Win prizes are vied for. A few are venerated, even adulated. True merit, uh, <laughs> meritic, <laughs> sorry, meritic, meritocracies are rare. We're going to let that go. Uh, Look it up online. It's in Freeze Magazine. Talent aside, whatever it is, human beings, like other animals, favor their own, cautiously adopting outsiders, especially those who will keep treasure close. A sociologist once told me that the only outcome your college to stick statistically and reliably predicts is your marriage partner. Our aggressive species has its survival methods, which are usual, which usually relate to competition, class, race, race, ethnic, ethnicity, religion, sex. These categories for exclusion and inclusion were long ago transformed into naturalized or so-called civilized mechanisms. Snobbery persists based on these dubious categories. Self-described snobs, necessarily deluded, sit on top of this survivalist heap, priding themselves on their taste. Taste, in quotes, in this instant connotes good, in quotes, but everyone has taste or preferences. I prefer not to, declared Bartleby. He had no taste for copying anymore. Calvin Tompkins new book, Marcel Duchamp, The Afternoon Inter Interviews, is my latest friend. Tompkins met Duchamp in 1959 to interview him for Newsweek magazine. Over time, the art critic and artist became friends. Of Tompkins' many books, two earlier publications are on Duchamp, The Bride and the Bachelor is 1965, and Duchamp, A Biography, 1996. Duchamp talked to Tompkins about taste, in quotes. Taste is an experience that I try not to let into my life. Bad, good, or indifferent, it doesn't come in. I'm so against interior decorators. You don't have to be happy or unhappy about it. You see, taste can't help you understand what art can be. Taste is a five-letter word no one discusses. Th I'm back to Lynn. Um, mentioning it, I notice friends and colleagues look at their menus or their nails. Mumbling begins, then silence. I'm not kidding completely. People like to believe their sensibilities, approaches, or attitudes have been educated, nurtured, or expanded beyond mere taste, bad, good, or indifferent. It is also a matter of taste not to appreciate taste. Duchamp distinguishes between the onlooker and the artist. 
The priority of the connoisseur, or whatever you call him, isn't to speak the same language as the artist. But don't say the artist is a great thinker because he produces it. The artist produces nothing until the onlooker has said, you have produced something marvelous. The onlooker has the last word on it. Duchamp holds that these formations, artist and onlooker, perceive the same object differently, having very different aims. But the onlooker will determine the work and f the worth and fate of the art -ist, art, art artist. Conversations among artists and writers about work often center on how to make it work. Craft, materials, and considerations of space regularly come into discussion. Work talk. Periodontists see diseased gums wherever they are, just as musicians and composers hear with their ears. I regularly question my preferences, why I like or dislike writing, a photograph. I don't trust experience, even if it has shaped me. I don't fervently trust what I think or believe. Well, I believe it still. A pox on absolutes. I could trace a geon genealogy of what I think and like, which is, to some extent, what I was exposed to, taught, made conscious of, and decided not to be or accept. Tendrils of difference and objections, spouting rebellions and self-discoveries. I could list them. But I couldn't create an order for my character and hold it me in a l neat line. When I learned to write, I wrote fast, not on the lines, only below or above. My preferences change and change again. Once I believed, doing studio painting with Ron Gorchov and Doug Olson, that the figure would never return. Once involved in showing and making experimental films, I believed Hollywood movies were uninteresting. One night, watching a structuralist, materialist black and white film of its cellular grain, I asked myself, why am I watching this? Like Bartley, I preferred not to anymore. Whatever I've renounced resides somewhere, pinging and ponging, because ideas live on, more or less alive in different moments. Being for or against something now is less interesting to me than understanding what it does, how it does it, and why it's being done. Okay, I, my last image is a street on the Lower East Side, and I'm, I'm including this because this is also, I think, a hugely important aspect of what my artwork is. Ever since we moved here in 1985, I've found amazing objects on the streets of New York, put out for the trash or whatever, or just put on the sidewalk, and I continue to do so. I found in front of our neighbor's house the other day some wood pieces, and I actually just made a new sculpture with them. So uh, not that I think my new work you know, is so different now being in New York than when I was in California, but I definitely have New York to thank for that opportunity to find all, all these amazing things on the street. And that is the end, and I thank you all for coming. Yeah, any questions, comments? Yes, it was. Yep. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was just wondering if the, if the George Rickey was in front of the museum when he was a kid, because it seemed yeah, to be some links to his work. There was also a sculpture by, uh, there's a pretty well-known artist named Laddie John Dill. I don't know if you, that sounds familiar. His brother was named Guy Dill, and there was a 
kind of horizontal piece in the garden section to the right as you walked up the steps in the museum. And I always thought it would be great if they'd planted a little hedge of dill weeds in front of the sculpture. That's my little idea. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I thought it was yeah. really a wonderful talk and gave us such a a uh, precise image of where you came f or come from and which context you grew, grew up in. When I look at my little booklet, I see such a subversive um, commentary on the world around us, and I didn't hear it in your talk mm. now. So I'd like to maybe understand a little better where, in which way that mm. you wrote above or below the lines, as you quote huh. Lynn. Well, do you mean subversive? I mean, I certainly don't think of myself as being cynical. That's not what you meant, is it? Or was it a little? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it was interesting that when I got reprimanded for wasting the paper, it didn't like. Uh, scar me. I, I just really remember it. I sort of learned a lesson from it. And then later, I was like, no, I can do that if I want. Um, I maybe, <sighs> okay, here's what maybe I could say about the work. I, I use really ordinary things from ordinary life, very kind of things that are often overlooked. And I'm hoping not in a cynical way. Um, I'm hoping to kind of make them elegant and a classical by what I do f to them formally. But I also admit that I play around a little with art, what art is. Like, I almost feel like I do put like my little sculpture on a pedestal and say, I'm calling this sculpture in a little bit of a rebellious way. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with the question, or does it, or, yeah? Um, yeah. Thank you, Everybody. thank you, B. Um, I also have a question okay. about um, your thoughts about taste and scale, mm -hmm. because a lot of your work, and a lot of the things that you referenced from the cars, the Victorian houses, to the bonsai, it's about a sort of miniaturization. You know, they, they can, they yeah. also are like doll houses or toy cars or the trains you talked about. So there's sort of this jump in scale that yeah. takes place. And um, I'm just curious if, if there is a relationship to what you called bad taste and an idea of sort of scaling down or scaling up and, and how you see that playing out in your work if it, if it comes mm. out at all. Um, boy, interesting. It's funny, you know, because I did talk about the cars and the houses as perhaps not being the greatest design. I think that's kind of what you're, the bad taste. I feel like the things that I use in my sculptures are so weirdly neutral in a way that they don't enter the realm of bad taste. More ignored than bad. And I guess what I hope to do with, you know, like you said, the scale thing, I often think of, I make these small things that act, that have a big attitude. They act monumental even though they're very small. Um, it's funny in relation to the Victorian houses because they're huge, they're big, tall. Um, um, but I, yeah, as far as my own work, um, I guess in a way, you know, I certainly do have my taste and I don't deny it, but I think I maybe try to not think about that with the, when I make my work. Okay, here's a good example. I've made work using the tops of yogurt containers. 
And I started using those and I realized I, that a lot of them are not what I would call great design. So in a way, maybe this is kind of relating to what you're asking. I decided to go ahead and just let go of that, my opinion about their design, whether it's good or bad. I, and partly because I was in a way more interested in the circular shape of the thing as far as what I was doing formally, I decided just to accept what was on there, good or bad, in a funny way maybe related to Deschamps' attitude, even though I claimed I didn't have that. <laughs> but I think in that case, yeah, I would ho hopefully just sidestep that question of what's good or bad or, you know. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, an observation, and tell me if this is right. It seems like a lot of your influences, uh, like Calder and the Banzai, are asymmetrical. And whereas your work, it seems like a lot of a lot of it's symmetrical. I think that's my classical. My, I'm kind of a classicist. I think we're going back to the Parthenon. I think I do make a lot of symmetrical thing. I find myself wanting to break that a little. And maybe, yes, those things are very asymmetrical. I feel like I do once in a while just deliberately put something a little off balance just to break that. I, I don't want to just make everything uh, balanced, symmetrical. I, I think you're right. A lot of it is. Uh, but, you know, so is the Parthenon. So you know, <laughs> that's classicism. <laughs> yeah? Right, right. Yeah, and I hope to do that with some of my work. Uh, you know, I don't, um, someone at once asked me if they thought my work was Baroque, and I think it's absolutely not Baroque. But I do find myself wanting once in a while to let myself think in that way, just to throw something in to, to, to throw it off balance, which is, of course, a lot of what Baroque did. Um, so I guess I'm trying for some kind of balance there. But I would say I'm generally a classicist, which I think is what you were picking up on also. Um, I wonder if you, well, I guess like with your work, particularly the materials like the plastics, the yogurt tops or the grocery bags, I wonder if they speak at all about your relationship to ecological issues or the environment. It's really funny you bro brought that up because I was actually going to apologize for making everyone be here when we should all be out. There's a protest against the Keystone Pipeline this evening, which I would have gone to if I weren't doing this. I'm, um, you know, it's a, there. the thing is, in my personal life, I'm very concerned about the environment, and I have gone to protests, and I do things. There's clearly a connection with the things in my, yes, the plastics, plastic, ba uh, plastic bags, you know, should probably be illegal. I mean, they are making them illegal in a lot of places. They do a lot of harm to the environment. Uh, I don't really want to, as far as the work, I don't really want to go too far down that road. I, I think it's there, but I but I don't think in a big way. Um, those things are all around us, and they come into my life, and in a way, um, I'm recycling them in my way. I, I, I mean, hopefully my sculptures with plastic bags aren't going to end up in the ocean. I mean, maybe in the future if no one cares about them, but, but for a while, maybe they won't. Um, Yeah, I just, um, 
Okay, I made a piece recently with a plastic bag. I particularly like this plastic bag, and I, it was a nice um, color, but on the bottom it had the whole text about please recycle or reuse this plastic bag a after the warnings about baby suffocation and stuff like that. And I realized, well, I had reused the bag, so I had followed the instructions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I should get like a brownie button for that, but I did, you know, reuse reuse the bag. So um, I would never attempt to to connect environmental issues with my art because I don't. I think it's like implied, but I don't really think it's there. It's kind of not what I do. I might be misremembering a little bit, but you were, you were, I, and I can't remember the question, I'm sorry, but <coughs> okay. I know you mentioned that you sometimes added a bit of rebellion into a piece. That was the way I thought you said it. I, I think what I meant by that, let me try to explain it better. There is a tradition of painting, sculpture, and I'm not, um, I'm not being negative about that as far as art history. But I think I started thinking, well, why couldn't these things made of these really common things be just as important as like a bronze sculpture, for example? And maybe that's when I say I'm being kind of rebellious about what I can get away with putting on a pedestal that a lot of people would maybe dismiss or... I don't even know if it would even annoy that many people. I would think it would more get dismissed. Um, and so maybe rebellion, maybe it's more just playing around with the idea of traditions of art. And because I am also very serious about them too. I like them to be shown in serious gallery museum settings on white pedestals because I think that's sort of a foil for their slightness or unimportance in a way. I'm hoping that I can make them more important by doing things formally to them to, to give them a kind of ele elegance. So when I guess when I said rebellion, I, it's just a of maybe a little bit in there. That's certainly not a big issue with me or anything. Yeah. yeah um, by the way, I love those yogurt top pieces. There's, I think, oh. some of your best stuff. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> but this this thing about classicism, where when I, it's probably a, just a different way of using it. But when I think about classicism, it's about conforming to some kind of timeless standard and. The thing that I thought was interesting was about how even though some of the stuff that you chose was sort of canonical modernist, like the Eames and Calder and stuff, the fact that you were talking about Victorian houses and 50s cars, the, the quality that you were focusing on is how they present themselves. And it's like you were taking, this is an observation, it's not a question. Yeah, no, I love it. I love hearing it. <laughs> It's like you were taking this this minimalist preoccupation of of presentation, and you're going like, okay, well, these things are the thing I'm interested in here is about how they present themselves too. So it's kind yeah. of discounting taste for this other quality. I, I know. I think that's actually well put. <laughs> I kind of wish I'd said that. It's true, there's another quality, right, another quality, like there's a quality of those Victorian houses that kind of side, it's not about how great they are as architecture, it's about they, they have this kind of amazing presence or, you know, and that's nice to admi admire that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay, I just want to make one observation. Um, when you, or, okay, question. 
So when you were t- telling the story about the nursery school, um, the collage project, the collage project, y- you had told me that story, and I thought that instead of it somehow illustrating your rebelliousness, that that was that you were showing your early conceptual. I uh, oh, I mindset. hope that's what that's what oh, oh, I meant okay. to say. If you misheard, no, I wasn't being rebellious. Okay, I, I had this idea about how the dog was inside, the, inside house, the house, okay. which I think is kind of, in a funny way, very conceptual. I thought, okay, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I could really imagine like making that art now and somehow telling people so they knew there was a thing underneath there, y- you know, but you know, I don't want to give myself too much credit as a tiny child, but... Um, <laughs> But I don't know. It's interest. It's just interesting to me that I so distinctly remember when that happened. Okay. 